that they may hear in their heart, Lord, more than just on the brain and so let it slide out the other ear. Bless the word today. Oh, Father, bless those that hear. Lord, work your will. Those things that are done on earth as they are in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. There you go, Pastor. All right. Thank you, Brother Clary. And I uh, want to welcome everyone to this morning's broadcast, Central Baptist Church, coming to you from the, from the office in Rockwall, our church facilities in faith. And we welcome you to visit our website and uh, to come and join us when we're when we announce where we're going to be meeting. We're going uh, before I start. Uh, Jimmy Bryan, one of our members, had a heart attack this week. I think he's in the Greenville Hospital. Pray for him. And then there's members who have loved ones with the coronavirus and pray for them. Today we're going to bring a, a doctoral study on something that seems on the surface very simple, but it has deep roots in the Word of God. You might turn and mark in your Bible Genesis 1 and John chapter 3. I want to ask a question this morning. And I want you to examine your heart for the answer. What did God create you to be? B-E. What did God create you to be? God created us to be, not to do. What do I mean? What we do does not make us what we are. But what we are does produce our doing. We're not human doings. We are human beings. But most people are focusing on doing and not being. And they got it backwards from what God intended. And as a result, we feel guilty we don't do more. We lose and sleep over it. We, uh, it promotes worry. It steals peace of mind. What does God expect from you and me? What does he expect from our church? And uh, do you think that's a fair question? What does God expect? So I want us to use the letter B today to answer four questions, which we'll only get to one, half of it this morning, half of it this evening at the of six o'clock period. The first is believe. The second is belong. The third is become. And the fourth is build. What does God expect us to be? God expects us to believe in him. God expects us to belong to him. God expects us to become like him. And God expects us to build his kingdom. So this morning, we're going to speak on God expects us. He created us to believe in Jesus. God created us with a divine, holy, even eternal purpose. Why did God create us? I think we can find the answer to all four in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Now, when we come there, we'll find the word, the Hebrew word for mankind. And when the, it says mankind, it's not speaking just of man. Is speaking of all people, male and female. And the Hebrew in Genesis 1 specifies making man in Genesis 2. Uh, he goes into detail of creating the female. So let's look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, let us, Trinity, God, Father, Holy Spirit, 
So God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our image after our kindness, likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over every, uh, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God created him, male and female created he them. Now, he said, let us, let us make. I believe this is referring to, we have to believe the word of God uh, to come to God, to have a relationship with God. And when God says, let us make man, we believe that God created us. That takes faith. That takes belief. And we can't have a relationship with God without it. So it takes belief to know God personally. Then, uh, and then he said, in our image. So man was created in God's image that we might belong to him and we might belong to each other. Number three says there, after our likeness. So there we are to uh, be like him. And then number four, let them have dominion. That means, I believe that refers to building the kingdom of God. So we believe in him, belong to him, become like him, and build his kingdom for him. As I said, simple but profound. You see, God's word is infinite. It's impossible to get to the end of understanding it. Uh, it has no ceiling. It has no bottom. And we need God to take us deep into his word to the place where we need to go with God. Now, what does God want us to know about believing in him? Sometimes we just take that for granted that we know and understand what that means. But I'm going to challenge you today that there's a lot more to it than most people know or believe. Now, the Bible said God created Adam. And then after Adam, he, he, cre he created a man, Adam. Then he created the woman, Eve. Now, there were two different separate acts two different times, two different ways, and two different Hebrew words describing it. Adam, in chapter 2, verse 7, God formed man. The Hebrew word is yastar. It means to squeeze into shape. God scooped man up out of the dust of the earth, and he squeezed him into a, a, a mold in him by in his hand, to a man, then God blew into that piece of clay that he had molded and, and squeezed into shape, inflating man's body with a living soul from the breath of God himself. So the Hebrew word for God making Adam is God squeezed him. Then the Hebrew word or making the woman is bala, different word. It means he fashioned her, <laughs> which uh, I like better, fashioned her. Also, it means to custom build. So she was a special custom made creation of God. Now, I like what one preacher said. He said, after God made Adam, he looked at him and said, I can do better than that. <laughs> Amen. And he did when he made the woman. So God has a designed purpose for each of us. He created us equal but not the same. We don't have the same role. We don't have the same sex. And we don't have the same uh, exact purpose. Some ways we have a unified purpose. Other, other, other ways... We have a special purpose. 
So we, God wants us to first believe in him. And by believing in him, we come to know God through belief. Now, I want to ask you a question because I know many of you come to this place, a dark place in your life. And one thing you'll notice in my preaching, I have a real passion to encourage people in my messages. But what happens to you or a person, a child of God, when they stop believing? And it happens. When you cannot uh, uh, feel the presence of God sometimes. And you stop believing in God. You backslide or go away from God. Now, I want to say right here, you cannot fall out of salvation because it is totally the gift of God. And it's undeserved and it's unearned grace. And it contradicts the Bible all over the place. You don't get that out of the Bible without changing the Bible, adding to the Bible, retranslating it, but you let the word of God stand and you cannot possibly uh, lose your salvation once you're truly saved. Now, a lot of people have false salvation. Now, that's a different subject, isn't it? But the word of God emphatically teaches us that once you are truly saved, you're always saved. But as a believer, on the other hand, a believer can have seasons of doubt, despair, discouragement, uncertainty. And we always believe in the existence of God if you're a child of God. But there's areas in our life that we have difficult believing God, difficult believing certain parts of the Bible and applying it. Uh, I sent yesterday to our group text a picture that the artist painted of Simon Peter and he sunk on the water. He walked on the water and then he sunk. And the name of the picture is the perspective, Peter's perspective of redeeming love. And this picture illustrates what Christ does for us when we lose faith. You see, Peter had faith when he first stepped out on the water. He had his eyes on Jesus. And then he took his eyes off Jesus and he sank. And as the artists show, he went all the way under the water. And the picture shows Jesus standing on top of the water, reaching down in the water and pulling Simon Peter up. Now, sometimes we lose our faith when we take our eyes off Jesus and we begin to, we begin to sink. Consequences come, circumstances come. We get into periods of desperation. We don't know what to do. But we must never forget that you will never sink so far that you don't, the Savior's grasp of redeeming love cannot reach you. Praise God, he's always reaching for us even when we're not reaching for him. Reaching for him. There's a song I used to sing as a teenager, believe it or not. Once my soul was astray from the heavenly way and was wretched and vile as could be. <laughs> but my Savior your love gave me peace from above when he reached down his hand for me. I was near to
to despair when he came to me there and he showed me that I could be free. Then he lifted my feet, gave me gladness complete. When he reached down his hand for me, I won't sing anymore. And you might say, thank you, brother. But anyway, that song always meant a lot to me. I could see Jesus reaching way down and picking me up out of the miry clay and the sinking sand. Are you sinking in doubt today? Disappointment, confusion, frustration, or anxiety? Do you know that God is so important to God? That first of all, in your life and relationship to him, that you believe and trust him. He wants you to believe and trust him at all times. And when you're, uh, when you're over your head, one fellow said, he's still under my feet, <laughs> holding me up. He's the rock of ages. He's still there for you. You know, I had to learn this a hard way. But the faithfulness of God is not based on your belief. I used to think if I stopped believing, he'd stop being faithful to me. But that's wrong. See, God's faithfulness is not based on your belief. And God's going to still be faithful whether you believe in him or not. Because he's God and he's faithful. His name is faithful. Why did God create you? What did he create you to believe? He created you to believe in him. Go back there to Genesis. And this time, let's look at Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15, if you, if you would. Genesis 2, 15. And uh, he said, I, um, I'm sorry, I can't read it. The Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the, the man, saying, Every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but the tree, the one tree of knowledge and good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, for consideration this morning, I don't want you today to, to think of this as God making up rules or giving Adam and Eve a do and don't list. This was a warning from God. God was giving them a warning and he let Adam know that there's one tree out there you don't want to eat because there's death if you eat it. God didn't want Adam to die. Second Peter 3, 4, or 9 says, God is not willing that any should perish. And that word willing means he has no desire for people to die. He didn't desire for them to die. Adam's belief was on trial. More than anything else, God wanted him to believe him. See, Adam had a freedom of choice, a freedom of his will. And Adam's belief was on trial, and he flunked out. See, the first thing God wants man to do is to believe him. Think of a parent, any good parent wants his child to believe them. You've heard this saying, I used to say it and I was wrong, that experience is the best teacher. That's not true. Experience can be the worst teacher. Experience can be a very cruel teacher. You see, you don't have to put your hand 
in the fire to know that it burns. Believe your parents. Don't put your hand in the fire to hurt you. Don't play in traffic. You're going to get run over. See, the best teacher of all is faith, F-A-I-T-H, faith. We need to believe our parents when they say, don't do that. For example, sex outside of marriage can be deadly. There's over 128 venereal disease that are passed around by the fornicators. Sex outside of marriage. I heard a medical scientist who was an expert in venereal disease on Focus on the Family. He said, when you go to bed with someone, you're going to bed with everyone that person has been to bed with. Now that is startling, that's scary. When you think of you, you have a sexual union with somebody, you're actually in contact with what, whoever they've been in contact with. That's a scientist talking there. Sex outside of marriage, can produce unwanted pregnancies, can produce shame, reproach, guilt, can ruin your life, it can defile your future marriage. Stay pure, believe God, believe your parents, believe a man of God that preaches to you. Stay chaste, stay pure, pure till marriage, and God has promised an eternal reward if you do it. Wait on sex until marriage. Believe God. God wants you to believe him. Believe your parents. When you're, here's another example. When you're teaching your child to drive, do you want them to learn that driving too fast is dangerous by you teaching them that, telling them that? Or would you rather them learn by having a car wreck? You see, isn't it better than just believe and take your word for it? You see, God's purpose in forbidding that tree to Adam and Eve, he wanted them to believe him. Do you see that? He just wanted them to believe him. Unbelief leads to sin. Here's a primary fact for you. God created you for a relationship. And that relationship is based on faith, believing God. I heard a good illustration. You know, back in the day, we, we, uh, we used soldering guns to solder things, electrical things. This father was in his workshop, plugged into the soldering iron, got it real hot, hot enough to melt the solder. And you know, he set it there on the little stand and his little girl was standing there beside him and he said, no, don't touch that, whatever you do. It's very hot, it'll burn you, it'll hurt you, don't touch you. Well, then the father turned away for a few minutes and you can probably finish the story. The little girl touched it, screamed, started crying, and the father rushes up and, and says, I told you not to touch it. Do you know what that little girl said? She said, well, you shouldn't have left it there because you know how I am. <laughs> That's a true story, by the way. Now, I wonder if Adam and Eve come up with that with God. Lord, if you didn't want me to eat that tree, why would you allow it to be there? God just wanted them to believe him. If they just believed him, they wouldn't have been hurt. Amen? Turn with me to Numbers 14 and verse 11. Numbers 14, 11. And it says this, and the Lord said unto Moses, how long will this people provoke me? 
How long will they err? They, be, they believe me for all the signs which I've shown among them. After all God did to prove himself to them, they still were in unbelief. Look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy chapter 132. It's right there. It's plain. 132 said, Yeah, yeah, in this thing you did not believe the Lord your God. And they sure got in trouble. Turn over to uh, uh, 9, 923. And it says, or maybe it's 33, uh, 23, 9, 23. Likewise, when the Lord sent you into Kadesh Barnea, which was the border there uh, by the promised land, he said, go up and possess the land which I have given you. And you rebelled against the commandment of the Lord, your God, and listen to this. Ye believed him not, nor hearkened to his voice. All God wanted to do is just believe him. The land was promised. The land was already theirs because God said so, but they didn't believe God. The reason we don't obey is because we don't believe. People die and go to hell because of unbelief. Look in 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 20, verse 20. 2 Chronicles 20, 20. And it said, and they rose up in the morning. They went forth in the wilderness of uh, Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, hear me, O Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God. And you shall, and ye shall be established. Believe as prophets, and so ye will prosper. You see, there it is, unbelief. Believe in God. But the first all, God created you to believe God first. Tonight we're going to preach to you. God created you to believe in him last. Our Father God, we pray that you will speak to the hearts of the people that heard this broadcast. Some of them are unsaved unbelievers that need to trust Christ with all their hearts, soul, mind, strength. Others are saved, but there's areas in their life they don't believe enough to trust you to obey you. And this is why they're defeated. This is why they're in the wilderness and not the promised land. And I just pray, oh God, that we would humble ourselves and trust you no matter what. We'll just believe God and say, as for me and my house, I believe God. I believe the word of God. I believe the promises of God. I believe God. I pray that the listeners this morning would say in their heart, I believe God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.